So uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to be with you here today. So I'm actually in Montreal. So uh, I guess I'm one of the only few to be, uh, to be where uh, I was supposed to be uh, due to the COVID situation. Uh, so uh, today I will tell you about a very, very new work uh, that we've been doing uh, in collaboration with Grégoire Alton Bonnet, who is a, a professor uh, at the NIH. Uh, and so uh, I will tell you it's really a new approach. Uh, nothing is published yet. So uh, I'm really uh, looking forward to hearing from uh, you and uh, I would be very happy to have uh, your feedback uh, on this new approach uh, on uh, robotic mapping and generative modeling of cytokine response. So before I go there, uh, I would like to tell you a bit where I'm coming from and what, dro what drove me to towards this project. So uh, I've been working on many topics over the year. Uh, I'm a physicist. I've been really interested in biological dynamics. Uh, I've been working a lot, say, on development, modeling of development. So for instance, on the top right here, you have a developing embryo where you see oscillation and you see wave propagating and pattern forming. So we've been working a lot on that. And also on the other, on the other side of our work, we've been working a lot on uh, ev uh, evolutionary algorithm, generally speaking. So as a way to really model biology. And, uh, and so in particular, uh, some of the system on top. And uh, recently uh, we moved towards immunology, like trying to get some sense of how immune response was working. And also we made some connection with some machine learning problem. And the reason why I'm telling you about this is because in all this problem we had, we have a very common uh, problem that all of, all of us have, which is how to, how to best model the data. And so uh, I am a physicist. And so I'm going to start with a physics analogy. Uh, that will help me introducing uh, what we are currently doing. And so uh, this is a GIF that I found on Twitter. It's not quite correct, but it's interesting. It's the contrast between heliocentrism and geocentrism. And so, uh, as you know, from, you know, history, uh, people have been, you know, like considering different models of planetary motions. And then, uh, you know, in the, old, in the old times, geocentrism was favored. And that gives you a very nice pattern. Uh, uh, you know, you can make a full theory of planetary motion with geocentrism. The, the ancient Greeks did it, but that's not very simple. That's not really understandable. And so that's why, you know, later on, uh, people discover heliocentrism was a more like a uh, natural way to describe the planetary motions. And so if you think about what is the distinction between heliocentrism and geocentrism, it's really that, you know, you want to have a low dimension representation of data. So you want a simple model and you want to have as few parameters as possible. And that's something that is really guiding a physicist, uh, you know, to describe physics system. But also I think uh, at least uh, in biology, there is an interesting question to know if something similar can be done. And recently with machine learning, people have explored a bit how to do that in a more systematic and automatized way. And so for instance, there was this, this interesting paper that was published uh, last fall, where people try to uh, discover what they call physical concepts with neural networks. So they basically consider planetary motions again and use so-called autoencoder strategies to uh, essentially derive equation of motion for, or try to really understand the equation of motions just from the data. And so one question you can ask is that, you know, can we do that, say, with biological data? Can you discover biological concepts to some extent? And so my talk is, a, is going to be a bit about, like it's an interesting system we've been considering where we believe we might have uh, something a bit similar to that. It will be much simpler and, and much less refined than uh, a full theory for gravity, but I hope to convince you that uh, some of those ideas can be applied and can tell you about biology and interesting uh, predictions as well. And so the system that we are considering uh, are, uh, is, is in immunology and uh, this is uh, cytokine secretion. So um, uh, to make a long story short, uh, when you have an immune response, uh, so you have like several layers of immune response, but one of the, uh, the first layer of adaptive immune response uh, are your T cells which are interacting with uh, antigen locally. And, uh, and then uh, the T cells see something or don't see something, they have to take a decision, but they will be activated or not, essentially. And when they're activated, they're going to communicate to other immune cells. And so the way they communicate are via uh, secreted cytokines. So cytokines are just protein that are just you know, released. And so these cytokines are uh, essentially read by the other immune T cells. And so then there's a dynamic a kind of self-organizing dynamics between uh, T cells and sorry, other immune cells. 
And so the dynamics of cytokines, cytokines are going to be very dynamic in time. And then based on these, there will be different immune response, different intensity of immunity. And so uh, the cytokine dynamics is quite complex actually. And so first you have many cytokines. Uh, and then, you know, when you try to vary parameters of the immune response, you're going to see a huge variability uh, in cytokine dynamics. So for instance, you know, like uh, here in the middle, uh, you have what happens when for IL-2, which is one cytokine, when you, you vary the concentration of antigen that you're presenting. So clearly sometimes you, you have you going up and then going down, but that's going to depend uh, on uh, the, the number of antigen presented. And on the right, this is what happens when you vary the number of T cells present. And so you can see immediately from that that you, have, you can have various response. And you have a non-monotonic response. Sometimes you can have a monotonic response. Uh, you also see the time scale is pr pretty long, which is really important uh, from, a biology, from a biological standpoint, because as you know, the immune response is something that with very, very, very time scale that can go uh, over years, actually, and you, we, we are very aware of those days about problems of immunity and how long uh, the COVID-19 immunity is going to last. So, you know, like the, the, all this problem of time scales, but you see, even in the initial response, you have a pretty long time scale over several days, which makes it very difficult to study very quantitatively, and I'll come back to that. Uh, also, what can happen in cytokines is that, so, you know, it's, it's more than simply uh, you know, an output of the immune response is actually something really important to coordinate a uh, response between different immune cells. And, you know, something, things, sometimes things go wrong and you might have heard about a cytokine release syndrome uh, in COVID-19. This is what happens when cytokine response is, uh, you know, somehow overshooting. And this is what can kill you, basically, uh, because your immune system is just, you know, like uh, lighting up from all the, uh, and, and you start, uh, you know, killing yourself with the immune system, essentially. And those things have been known also and are observed uh, in immunotherapy. So for instance, CAR T cell uh, induced uh, cytokine release syndrome. So cytokines are really important. Uh, they clearly do something. And so it's really important uh, to try to understand how the dynamic of cytokines is regulated and, and, and trying to model it. And that's the goal of my talk today is to tell you about uh, our approach to do that. And so uh, to approach this, so, so uh, the problem we have uh, is that it's complicated, obviously. And, and also you have an issue, which is that the cytokine dynamics uh, is, is lasting over a very, very long time. So you saw on my previous slides, you can have a change of dynamics over 100 hours. And so uh, there are many parameters in this situation, in this part, in the system, because you can have, you know, various uh, antigen, uh, you can have various number of cells. Uh, the time scale is very long, it's varying between uh, conditions. So obviously it's a very complicated system. And so if you want to have a complete picture of the system, you need to find a good way uh, to, uh, to do it in a systematic way. And so this is where, uh, with our collaborators, what we've been doing is to develop a robotic platform to do essentially multiplex measurements of T cell activation over a very, very extended period of time. So you can measure things over one week. And so in the next slide, I'm going to show you just to illustrate exactly what happened, what is, what, what, what is this robot. And so I have a small uh, video to show you this. So uh, this is a typical uh, Tekan robot that we have. And so, you know, the way it works is that you have the plates and then you take the plates and then what, what the robot is going to do automatically, automatically uh, very conditions and measurements uh, in each of these little well. And so you see, you just remove the cover and then you see uh, the pipettes coming now. You'll see in one second. Okay, this is the cinematic part of the, of the, of the talk. Well, I, I, I also more, I have more movies later on. And so you see, then you pipette, uh, you just do everything you want uh, here automatically. Uh, and so, of course, what you, what you can do is that in each different well, you can do slightly different experiments. And so you can automatize and program everything. So you see, like, we are, like each little pipette is injecting, you know, what it needs to do. Uh, and then you do that, also, and so on and so forth. And so the big advantage of this is that you prepare your experiments, you know, uh, at the first day. And then you let it go, and you can let it go automatically for, uh, you know, may, may, or, or roughly one week, say. And so, uh, you know, it requires debugging and everything, but, but the good, uh, the advantage of this is that you can massively, you know, you can generate massive data over an extended period of time and get relatively uh, precise, uh, you know, measurements of everything that happens uh, in, this, uh, in this little uh, test kit. 
And so, uh, well, you know, it takes a lot of work to do to design, but once you have something like this, well, you know, uh, you can just, so we, we're working on a, a classical OT1 mouse uh, immune cells. Uh, and so uh, you take T cells, APCs are antigen presenting cells. So then you mix them with different concentration. You have a very high control on how you can measure this. So these are going to be different conditions with a different quantity of antigen, different strengths of antigen. You do the, you, you put that in a robot for one week. And then what you can do is that you can just monitor uh, what happened during the robot in real time. And, uh, and also what you can do is that you can do, uh, you know, many time points. You can also do, uh, look at different markers at the surface of the cell. And then, you know, you try to see what happens. It's, it's just a way to really understand precisely uh, the dynamics of uh, this immune response in test tube uh, in a very controlled environment. And so to give you a sense, so we're going to focus on cytokines. We have all the data, but let's focus on cytokines first. And so uh, here is typically what the kind of data we have. So they are, uh, so this is a two, you know, the 2D axis and then each act on each plot, uh, there are uh, different conditions. And so from uh, left to right, these are stronger antigens and from top to bottom, these are different cytokines. So uh, it's a bit small because there's a lot of data, I apologize. I apologize, but uh, you see clearly like from uh, left uh, to right that, for instance, on the first row, there is more and more uh, response. The different colors are different number of, of cells. Uh, and then you see, you know, like different cytokines are different dynamics. It's not entirely clear what happens uh, for now, but uh, you see you can really get a very good sense of the entire dynamics of the system. And what is really good that with robot, with the robot, you can really do that many, many times in a very reproducible way. And uh, we check this many, many times. Uh, our so I'm a theorist, so I'm not doing the experiments, but my experimental uh, collaborators are extremely good. They're really, really, it's super reproducible. You can really get a very good sense of the cytokine dynamics. And so we are very confident that you can work on this and try to uh, understand what happened there. Okay. And so, and now what we want to do is that with this data, we want to be able to basically build a model. And so, uh, uh, yes, on Teresa, how could I, you know, how, how would I uh, build a model out of that? And so the uh, first thing is that you need to know what are the right variables to consider. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? I, I, have a, I have a message that my internet connection is, is unstable. Is it, is it okay? Yeah. yeah, I have no. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay, I was, I had, I had a scary message. Sorry about that. Uh, okay, so, um, so you have a completed data set. And so the first thing that, what are the right variables? So that's complicated in physics. Now it's easy in physics. We know that position, velocities, angular momentum are the right variables. But for a biological problem, you might not know what the right variables are. And then once you have the right variable, you write a simple equation on those variables. And then from the simple equation, you can do prediction on say the angular law, the angle uh, as a function of time. Okay, so that's one thing to do. And so now in our case, what we have is that we have a complete data set. And uh, what we want to get there, what we want to get from this data set essentially is that what is the strength of the immune response? And uh, we're going to call that antigen quality. I'm going to come back to what we mean by antigen quality in a second. Uh, but you know, it's not entirely clear how you, uh, how you deal uh, with this in the middle. You know how, uh, And so, uh, okay. and so uh, why first antigen quality? So the reason why we focus on antigen quality is that, so, so it's known that different antigens are going to, uh, to basically uh, activate an immune response more, more or less strongly. And uh, for instance, in immunotherapy, we know that the presence of strong gene is going to be a very, very good predictor of uh, the quality uh, and of the, uh, of the performance of immunotherapy. So if you are so a priori, if an antigen is a good quality, you can induce a stronger immune response and then that will lead to better treatment, for instance. So that's why it's very important to know uh, this antigen quality. But so far, it's, very, it's basically there's no real way to measure it uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very precise way. You only have some qualitative uh, uh, ways to measure antigen quality, like this uh, Ellis spot uh, system that I show you on the right that is really like very, you know, uh, digital, uh, digital way to 
nitrogen is good or bad. And so then, uh, the goal system is to be able to get a much refined measure of antigen quality uh, that are presented. Okay, and so uh, so for this, we develop a machine learning pipeline to uh, to build the antigen quality. And so there are two two layers on the pipeline. The first the first layer is essentially what are the features that matter. And so uh, for this, uh, we 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 add we did, did a little uh, they do, they tour and use an averaging algorithm to try to find essentially the most informative features in the data. And then once we had identified those most informative feature of the data, we use a neural network to reduce dimensionality of these features and to generate a, a simple model of what happens. And hopefully, uh, we get uh, then prediction of the system. And so uh, to make a long story short, uh, so to identify interesting feature of the data, so uh, uh, we, we use an evolution algorithm to essentially, again, identify what are the most important features on the cytokine dynamics. And so this is something I'm not going to go too much into the detail, but basically uh, we can evolve a network in the computer that is going to take the data and then try to predict the quality uh, in a re relatively crude way, but we found a way to do it uh, using evolutionary algorithm we have developed in the past. And so uh, the, what we identify from this is that uh, uh, an interesting feature, which, uh, which is really informative of the data is going to be, uh, so it's not a complicated function, but it's not completely trivial either. Uh, we consider the time course of cytokines, and then we consider the integral of the log of the, of the cytokines. So we discovered that those features are very informative. And so uh, once we have those informative features, what we can do is that, so now for each cytokine on the left, you see this is a graph of the integral of the log of the cytokine concentration in different conditions. And so then what we can do is that we can use a neural network and then we can use a simple neural network. We, we, we try to make it as small as possible to make, have a model as compact as possible or as interpretable as possible to predict the antigen quality. And so uh, we're going to focus in the middle. Uh, we made the two node neural network, a two node simple one, one hundred layer neural network is enough. And so this neural network is able to predict the strength of the antigen. And so uh, to, to train this, we have several ligand qualities. So this is the, this name N4, Q4, T4, V4, D4, E1. There are known ligands of different uh, qualities. And then we train our neural network to recognize those ligands. Uh, and so it will tell us, you know, uh, a ligand is N4, a ligand is T4. And then once we have trained the neural network, we can focus in the middle because the, the middle tells you what is the structure of the data, uh, what tells you in the, in the cytokine dynamics that it is a strong or weak, or weak network. And so uh, we have two nodes in the middle. And so what you can do is that you can project uh, in 2D the dynamics of these two nodes. And that gives you this kind of trajectories. And so uh, the, the two axes are just node one and node two uh, in our neural net network, uh, plotted as a function of the other. Uh, and then uh, what you can do is that you plot the time course of, uh, the of, of this node as a function of time, you know, through the neural network. And then the different colors here correspond to different strengths of the ligand. And then what you see immediately is that you have a very, very good uh, separation of these trajectories in this, we call that a latent space in this space, which means that you can, based on the dynamics in the latent space, you can very, very easily distinguish between these different ligands. So for instance, you see all the blue ligands that are going on top like this. Uh, like with the, those, are, those are the strong ligands. Strong ligands just go all uh, uh, in, in the same direction on top. And then the weaker, slightly weaker ligands like Q4 and T4, they go a bit horizontally and then they go down. And the very weak ligands, they just go down immediately. So you see, you have, you have a, a very, very simple uh, description of the dynamics. And, and to, to, make, to come back to my uh, heliocentrism and geocentrism uh, analogy. So these are uh, now what we're going to look at on these movies are we look at, we look, going to look at a three direction in cytokine space. So uh, here we consider a TNF alpha, IL2 and uh, interferon gamma. And so on the left, I plotted as a function of time for, uh, for the data set we consider the log uh, of uh, the construction of the cytokines. And so you see there is some structure here, but there is still a bit, you know, you have like overlays between trajectories across. So even though there is some structure, uh, it's not quite clear what happens here. But then when you move to the integral of the log on the right, you see that there is a plane in this 3D space where you have a very simple trajectories of, uh, of the system. 
And so uh, that, that's why I, I bring back my energy heliocentrism versus geocentrism. So once you have found the right set of variables here, the integral of the log, you have a very simple description of the dynamics of the cytokines. And so uh, this, is, uh, this is why these are interesting features for us, because once we have the simple dynamics, the hope is that as a physicist, maybe we can find a simple model of what happens uh, in this place. So and this is where uh, I'm going now, and I'm going to explain you once you have these very simple features on the right, what we can do from there. Okay, and so if I, if I go back to this trajectory, so the thing that struck us when we saw this uh, dynamics that were again completely automatically derived, you know, using essentially machine learning, that it really looked like uh, rocket trajectories. And so, and actually, it's a very good analogy. What we did is that we just put a very simple, what we call ballistic model. Uh, where uh, you have a kind of uh, initial phase where you go, you, you are going up for some time with the parameter that we call V0, and then you let the system relax and see what happens. And so in terms of parameters, it means that when you go back to the latent space, we can define a few parameters uh, that are going to describe entirely the trajectories uh, in, uh, in uh, this latent space. So we have this part of V0, which is the strength uh, and the orientation uh, of the system, which is given by theta. And then we have a parameter T0, which is kind of the parameter regulating the bending of this curve. And then we have an asymptotic direction, VT, which is like a constant drag, which is actually is the same for all cytokines, so that, uh, for, all, for, all, uh, for all experiments. So that's one thing we realized. And then we have this kind of a priori complicated parameterization of the system. But what, we, what was very, very striking, so first, OK, we, we can very make easily some fits. That's really not a problem. But then what was very striking that when we start to correlate these parameters in different exponential conditions, we see that actually there is no four parameters. There is only one parameter, essentially. One parameter is controlling all the cytokine dynamics. You see it very clearly here. So it's a, this is a distribution. Uh, this is, these are plots that are showing you the distribution of parameters uh, as a function of one another. And you see those are essentially lines. So if you look at the second one, there is a line, so we get from red to green to yellow to blue. This is a single line. We see that here V0 is a simple function of theta, which is the angle. The intensity of the response is a simple function of the angle of the response. And as a, as a similarly, V0 is a simple function of T0. And so that means that our cytokine response, they're just essentially controlled by one single parameter. There is, even though they look complicated, they are really not complicated. There's only one single parameter. And maybe one thing I have not specified that to do that, we varied the concentration of antigen, the quality of antigen, you know, many things. But the thing that seems to really, there is only one parameter that is controlling it. And actually that's not entirely true. Uh, I show you later. But uh, then once you have one parameter that is controlling everything, we can of course generate synthetic data. And that's what we call generative modeling. We can really, with this parameter, we can essentially reconstruct any kind of response in, in the cytokine space. So now there's another, there's, I told you that's not entirely true, there's only one parameter that matters. We found another parameter that, is, that, is mattering, that matters as well. This is the number of T cells. And so when we vary the number of T cells, and then we look at the connection between the parameters. So here, two of our parameters, T0 and V0, V0 is kind of the strength of the rocket, and T0 is like how long the rocket uh, is, 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 uh, is turned on we see that there's basically a slope and that the slope depends on the T cell number, which means that our spore model uh, of cytokine dynamic is able to uh, has actually discover the number of cell as a parameter. So the parameter is essentially the correlation, the number of cells is a correlation between this T0 and this V0 parameter. So we mean that our model contains biological information that we did, that we were not, that was not included in the initial training. So that's, we think it's a very good sign that our model is, is correct, consistent and interesting because it discovers new biology. You know, it's not simply overfitting or anything. There really is something fundamental that, are, that is relating to biology, connecting the parameters to, to, to parameterize uh, these this trajectories in latent spaces. So uh, you can do various things with this model. So for instance, uh, uh, one thing that, that might be obvious now is that you can, you can discover, you can measure quality uh, of a new ligand. So imagine you don't know uh, the strengths of the ligand. Then what you do, so for instance, you imagine you don't know the, the strengths of the pink ligand on the right. So what you can do is that you could project the dynamics uh, of this ligand, in, of the cytokine uh, driven by this ligand in 
the latent space. And then what you're going to see that is going to be nicely between uh, the orange and the blue one, which means that it's an intermediate quality. Uh, and so uh, we can basically recover. So we, what we did is that we train our system on a subset of ligands. And then we try to see if it was able to predict the quality of other ligands, which really was the initial goal. As I told you, we want to be able to predict uh, the strength of the antigenicity of some ligands. And then what we saw uh, is that uh, it works. We, we are able to, uh, to predict uh, the strength of new ligands. So our system works, our framework works. Okay. So now another question you can ask that I told you is our, our framework is, you know, is uh, projecting uh, uh, is, is projecting this system in, uh, in, uh, sorry, I, I, uh, I, I chatted, <laughs> I opened, I, I opened the, 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 the chat box. I cannot, I cannot, I, I have to close it. Sorry about that. Okay. So, uh, we were able to, uh, to get, uh, to, um, from, I, from, uh, it's from the from the cytokine space through the 2D space. We're looking at concentration of cytokine and we project that to this 2D latent space. But now can you reconstruct from this 2D space, this 5D space of cytokine that we put in initially? So do we, how much information do we lose when we do this projection? And so it turns out that uh, the answer to this is not many. Uh, so uh, here, what we did, we compared, so we train another neural network to reconstruct from this ballistic simple model into the, the actual cytokine dynamics. Uh, and so what we see, and so here on this slide, we compare uh, the data to the reconstruction from latent space. And so uh, data are solid and uh, uh, data are dashed and solid are reconstruction from latent space. And so what we see is that, for instance, our simple model into the our simple ballistic model completely explains IL-2. We can really completely understand IL-2 dynamics from our simple model. Uh, so that's really good. Even though this is quite variable, as you can see, you know, sometimes they slide, sometimes going up and down, sometimes there's nothing. Uh, in general, also for other cytokines, weaker peptides are quite well predicted. So we can see, you know, some of them are going up and staying, staying up. And then the level where they're staying is quite well predicted by our model. The thing we missed, are, uh, are for some for some cytokines like uh, IL-6 and TNF-alpha, uh, we miss sustained activation. So somewhere when we do the reconstruction, uh, we we miss some kind of sustained activation that is that is somehow keeping your response up. So when we go from 2D to 5D, we will need to add another little thing somewhere to explain why uh, the system uh, is staying up. But by and large, we would say it's not, you know, it's not a big, uh, it's probably not a big change to do. We just need to find, uh, to add a kind of feedback in our 2D model to be able to explain uh, IL-6 and TNF-alpha dynamics. So by and large, we believe our very simple representation in 2D uh, and our ballistic model can explain quite well uh, all data, all data and all cytokines. Okay, so now I try to give you a biological intuition of what happens, you know, like why, why do we want to get a more biological explanation of what happens here? Why are we doing all of this? And so by and large, what we discovered is with this approach is that if you look at, for instance, IL-2 on the left, uh, the dynamics of IL-2 is driven by two parameters. Uh, so there's one parameter, uh, which is which called V0, which is the magnitude, the strength of, of the response in our latent space. And so you see basically corresponds roughly to uh, the maximum level of IL-2. It's not exactly the maximum level, but it's correlated to the maximum level. And then what happens, so IL-2 is turned on, and at some point it's going to be turned off. And uh, it's turned off, this is what's called T0. It's really like when the, when the rocket somehow is kind of uh, getting down. Uh, and so, uh, so, and what we see from our model is that V0 and T0 are correlated. And then also we have another parameter which is related to cytokines. We saw that the other cytokines compared to IL-2 uh, are regulated in the same way by another parameter theta zero, which is also related to V0 T0. So they are all connected, but basically the ratio of cytokines, the magnitude and the cutoff time are connected to one single parameter, which is basically the ligand quantity, quality, sorry. And so uh, our model, the model we have in mind is the following, we have a ligand quality. And so uh, just to make uh, as, 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 uh, as uh, you know, a short, uh, you know, 
as an add-on, we understand how we can make a model where you, you can feel ligand quality independent of quantity of ligands. So that's something that is really not easy to do a priori, but we understand to, how to do that. You've been working on that for years. We have a very simple model and very, very nice prediction about what kind of model can explain this. And so once you have ligand quality, what you can do is that we know that ligand quality from our analysis, ligand quality are, are uh, influencing in a very predictive way both cytokine production and the cutoff time of cytokine production. So that's, those are the two parameters V0, T0. And what is interesting is that those two parameters are essentially proportional to one another. Okay. And then uh, the dynamics itself, well, you know, uh, is actually given by very simple ballistic phenomenological equation. So we have a complete description of the system. Uh, and we can really understand uh, very well the cytokine dynamics from all these approaches. The model is really on the right. It's quite simple, but uh, it's, not, it's not simple, but not trivial. And that was really derived from uh, our machine learning inspired uh, approach. And so now one question we add is that, well, you know, can we, so we always see in our data that V0 and T0 are proportional, that the, the strength of the immune response is proportional to the cutoff time of the immune response, essentially. So can we try to break this correlation? So uh, we know already that the slope, the, 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 the magnitude of the correlation is depending on the number of cells. But what we try to do, what we would really like to do is vary one independently of the other. And so for this, we use drugs. And so uh, what is really interesting is that it's actually very difficult to break this correlation between this V0 and T0. And again, I think that's uh, uh, an interesting conclusion of our approach, that we identify those two parameters that are a priori different, but actually they are, in our data they are very correlated and it's very difficult to, un to uncorrelate them. And so for instance, when we, when we use this drug here, so Dazatinib, uh, it it's basically decreases both T0 and V0. So which means that this is a system that is effectively decreasing antigenicity. You transform a strong antigen into a weak antigen. Uh, conversely, there is this uh, ACD28 uh, drug, which is basically pushing up the entire immune response. So you can transform a weak antigen into a strong antigen. But again, you do it in a correlated way. You, you, you're really changing both T0 and V0 at the same time. It's very difficult to vary one independently of the other. There is one exception to this. So if we put recombinant human uh, IL-2, what we see is that we can increase the consumption time while keeping V0, the strength of the immune response constant. That's the only drug that is breaking the correlation. Uh, but it's just, to some extent, it makes sense because recombinant IL-2, so this is mouse cells, so they see, human, they see mouse IL-2, but then we're just adding human IL-2, and it's known that human IL-2 can essentially act at, like mouse IL-2. So kind of, we're just basically, uh, essentially, directly changing one level of the system. Uh, and so it's not a big surprise that it's able to vary T0 with that V0. But what is really striking that anything else, any other modification we introduce in the system, you cannot really break this V0 T0 correlation, which means that uh, probably uh, we are really uh, having a, a very strong biological constraint connecting these two parameters, which are completely different. They should, they should not be related. You know, one is really the strength of the response. The other is really like the cutoff time when you shut off the response. They should not be related, but apparently they are. Okay, and so uh, one thing we're moving forward now is that, uh, you know, uh, when you look at, the, we can look at different cells. And so I'm going to, to go quickly on this slide, I'm almost done. Uh, but uh, basically we see the same kind of structure for all kinds of different T cells in different contexts. So we're very confident that our approach uh, can be generalized. And so I'm going to wrap up now. Uh, and so uh, to, what we have, we have, uh, you know, we, I showed you high throughput, high quality data that allow to quantify, analyze precisely like cytokine response. So uh, I, I, I insisted on it, but you know, this, those are things you see over days, sometimes weeks. So you really need something automatized to do it, to do, be able to do it properly. Uh, we have an interpretable and quantitative modeling, mostly to be done. Uh, we have this simple ballistic model that can explain cytokine dynamics. Uh, and so what we identify, we identify there is a kind of continuous strength of, uh, of um, uh, cytokine response. We can see that we can really identify the strengths of antigen on one simple axis. And uh, well, our goal is to more, move more toward medicine, you know, uh, really assessing immune response a priori for different T cells. And so really the goal we have in mind is immunotherapy. Like if we are able to know that immune T cells is going to respond stronger 
uh, in a more strongly in, in a stronger way than another immune cells you know it could be potentially good for immunotherapy and that's why we're using this this is a way to use this framework uh, uh to to understand that and there are many other things we understand with this framework but that's really one direct application so I'm going to wrap up here. Uh, I want to thank my collaborator, Grégoire Altambonnet. So Suraj Asha did most of the experiments that I showed, and Angela Lee started the project. And in my group, uh, two grad students have been working on the theory side, uh, Thomas and uh, Francois. And, uh, and since you're not in Montreal, I just wanted to show you three pictures of Montreal. And, and just also to, to uh, so, so this is summer, so it's nice. But, uh, you know, the campus is changing colors as a function of time. It's a very nice city and country uh, to live in. Thanks a lot. I'm going to wrap up now. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Francois, for the amazing talk. Really appreciate it. Uh, we have a couple of questions here. Uh, the first one is, what are the original measurements? Are they protein concentration or gene, uh, gene expression? So uh, for what I showed you, these are protein concentration. So we, can, uh, we have a way to monitor as a function of time, protein consumption in a very precise way. Uh, so that's also one of the advantage of the uh, of the framework and the robot uh, developed by our, by our collaborator. Um, uh, so uh, we also have other outputs, I have to say. So we also have markers at the surface of the cell. Uh, we are in the process of also using them, like to see if we can refine uh, the model. But what's very surprising to us is that, I mean, it's, it's quite preliminary, but the cytokine essentially contain most of the information. Like when you add the markers in the, in the loop, you don't really get more. Uh, and so, and the only thing we, so it's very preliminary, but what we expect to find is maybe some markers at the surface of the cell will actually respond to the cytokine. So it so might be as informative as a cytokine, but for now really like just looking at the cytokine is really the best way to understand what happens and to, and to understand, especially as I told you, the quality of the antigen. This is really what we're looking for. Thank you. And another question, what is the input to the original neural network with two latent variables and what is the output? Yeah, so I, I went very quickly on that. So uh, let me maybe go back to the slide. Uh, so uh, you see, can you see the slide? Yes. Okay. So, uh, so, okay, so what we did is that we identified that, so we have the cytokine concentration as a function of time. And so we identify with our evolutionary algorithm that the log of the integral, the, sorry, the integral of the log of the concentration are informative features uh, in the cytokine dynamics. So those are the things we give as input for our, of our neural network. So that, those are like, you know, time courses like this. So it go, it's going up as a function of time because it's an integral of something positive. So that's why it's going up. And so we give that as an input of our neural network. And then we train the neural network to be able to base on those dynamics. So we give the dynamics at every single time point uh, we have, you know, we have the log of the integral. And we use uh, these dynamics to predict the quality of uh, the, 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 the ligands, which is, you know, so a priori, this is the name, you know, N4, Q4, T4, V4. So it's more like a category, like in, in classical neural network, uh, in, in, you know, like you would di distinguish between one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. But, but so we give that, but, but the goal here is to recover the quality because we know that those ligands are ordered as a function of the quality. And so what is really interesting actually is that when we give this as, a, you know, a, a, it's a categorization problem, but what we recover in the middle is something that is, that is giving you a continuous score that is corresponding to the quality of the integer. And so this is why, you know, we train this to discover this classification, to, to which we solve this classification problem. But the goal is really to get what, to get what we have in the middle, which is to have a continuous description of the cytokine trajectories. And this is what gives you this nice movie in the very end, where uh, you know you uh, you get uh, oops, you get this uh, this uh, this uh, on the right. You see that as a from the bottom, we have a nice separation, a continuous separation of the. So even though we categorizing stuff. We can, we can then recover this kind of axis of antigenicity that we did not give the algorithm, actually discovered it by itself. So that's also one thing that makes us very confident in our approach. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, perhaps we can squeeze in one more question here yeah. uh, that says, perhaps I missed it in your simulations. How was the effect of drug addition 
uh, different for weak and strong ligands. Okay, so uh, w the drug addition were not a simulation, they were actual experiments. So uh, what we did is that we added to the cell different drugs, and then we saw how, uh, we saw how the scene was, was changing. And so what we saw for, uh, for so one of the drugs, it was lowering our parameters T0, V0. When we redo the fit and everything, it was lowering our T0, V0, which means that it lowers antigenicity. While another drug, it actually increased antigenicity. So it has opposite effect. One was making the response stronger, one was, was doing the response weaker. But what is really interesting is that it's doing it in a very consistent way. We don't break this kind of wide dimensional uh, parameter dependencies that we, we recover from the, from the machine learning algorithm. 